the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by Kraken, simply the best Bitcoin podcast in Bedford. And today I've got a second interview with Giacomo Zucco, where he explains the benefits of Brexit. But before that, I've got a message from my show sponsors. So first up, Kraken, you know these. They are the single best exchange in the world, the best place for buying and selling Bitcoin, the only exchange I use for buying and selling Bitcoin. And as I've said on the last couple of shows, they've recently announced that they're allowing customers to invest in the company. So via Bank to the Future, investors can invest in the future of Kraken with a minimum investment amount of $1,000 and there's still time to get involved. I was out in Munich last week and I was talking to Trace Mayer about this and he was telling me about all the exciting things coming up for Kraken. Without doubt, Kraken are the single best exchange in the world. And if you are interested in this, you can find out more at Bank to the Future, which is B-N-K-T-O-T-H-E-F-U-T-U-R-E dot com and just click on the invest button. And also, I've got it confirmed, I'm going to be recording an interview with Nick Pococo very soon. He's Kraken's chief security officer and we're going to be discussing all things crypto security related. So keep an eye out for that. But if you want to join me in supporting Kraken, the best exchange in the world, head over to kraken.com, which is K-R-A-K-E-N.com. That is kraken.com, which is K-R-A-K-E-N.com. Next up, the mighty BlockFi, my longest ever sponsor. They are creating the future of Bitcoin financial services, and they've got two products which are currently available. But they also just had a huge new announcement. They're going to be supporting the Gemini stablecoin, GUSD, across the platform. With BlockFi interest accounts, clients at launch will be eligible to earn 6.2% APY, which is paid monthly with a minimum balance of $2,500. And balances above 100,000 GUSD will earn a tiered rate of 1.5% APY. I'm going to be using this. I'm going to be using surplus business funds to sit in the account and earn more interest than I currently get in my current bank. If you want to find out more about this, head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. That is BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. Okay, so on to my interview with Giacomo, and it was great to get this in the diary, as Brexit is something that I've wrestled with quite a bit. Initially, I was pro-Brexit, but as the vote came close, I voted Remain for a whole bunch of different reasons, talking about with my friends, feeling like the arguments for Brexit weren't strong, but kind of thinking we were better unified with Europe. But since the vote, I've kind of found myself being more pro-Brexit, you know, following the disastrous attempt to negotiate an exit and feeling like we've been really pressured by Europe to remain part of the EU and being offered really not favourable conditions to depart I don't know I just didn't like it didn't like it at all I have tried to listen to both sides of the argument but I've kind of found myself believing that we'd be stronger outside of the EU and yes it's going to be a painful exit initially but I have my concerns about the EU how it's run and how important my vote is I don't know these big super states they just don't feel great to me having heard Giacomo discuss this before he's somebody who's very articulate has a very strong libertarian view and very strong views on you know larger states versus smaller states I knew he'd be great to go on I knew he'd have some very solid points about this and he's about as far from a status as you possibly could have so yeah great to get him on great to discuss this with him great to hear him talk about whether we do really have a democracy and the benefits of regulatory competition So yeah, it was great to have him on and listen about this. And, you know, as ever, if you've got any questions about the interview, you know you can reach out to me. And just to tell you about a couple of events coming up, I will be emceeing the Crypto Compared Digital Asset Summit on the 12th of June next week in London. The event features a great lineup of speakers. We've got a keynote from Andreas Antonopoulos. We've got Tom Lee, Melton Dumours, and Gabor Gabax from Vanek. You can still get tickets, and they've got a discount code. It's 20% off if you use WBD. And you can register at summit.cryptocompare.com. They'll also accept in Bitcoin and Ethereum for payment. And next month, I'm going to be emceeing the Bitcoin 2019 conference alongside the amazing Naomi Brockwell in San Francisco. So I'll be telling you more about that soon. Lots more interviews also going to be recorded at these events. And listen, if you're enjoying the podcast and you want to support what I do, you can check out my website. It's www.whatbitcoindid.com and click on the support section. And I do need to say a massive thank you out to my patron top tier sponsor. That is Rise Wallet. They are a new way into Bitcoin. There are no signups. You just scan the card and you are holding Bitcoin. If you want to find out more, head over to risewallet.com. 
Okay, I hope you enjoy the interview. If you want to reach out to me, if you want to discuss it, you can email me on hello at whatbitcoindid.com. The reason I want to talk to you about Brexit is a long time ago, you spoke to me about it once, very shortly, or it was a tweet I saw you put out, and you were talking about smaller states are better. It might have even been in our first interview. When Brexit was coming up, I was going to vote for Brexit. And then one of my friends said to me, he said, the great thing about the EU, it's the best peace project in modern time. And I kind of started feeling guilty. And then I didn't vote for Brexit. And now Brexit's been such a mess, I'm kind of veering towards wanting Brexit, but I don't have a proper articulate argument about it. So I know you do. So a good starting point. What are your general thoughts on the EU? What is good about the EU and what is bad about the EU? So first of all, there is a a lot of unpacking this uh, naive uh, correlation sold as causation between European Union and peace. The European Union is basically uh, the merge of two kinds of projects. One project was uh, of market unification, so basically uh, give up uh, artificial political barriers to market. And uh, I think there are very good theoretical reasons to think that uh, this kind of project can help peace because uh, it was uh, Bastia, Frederick Bastia saying that where the, there are not mer, uh, there are not goods and people crossing borders, then there will be tanks and soldiers crossing borders. So the uh, the, the, uh, the destroying or reducing barriers to exchange to free exchange can help peace. The second part of the European Union project was uh, political centraliz- centralization. So uh, unification. Hom- uh, homologation, uh, uniformation of political uh, decisions, so basically centralization of decision. And I think that second part, there is no reason to think it will help uh, peace, it never did. Historically, more centralized society where the control over society is, uh, is delegated to uh, basically a single point of failure, uh, they seem to to fare better in the short time because maybe you have less uh, psychological perceived chaos. So for ex- I give you an example. In all the Far West age of cowboys killing each other in the Far West uh, since, let's say, the beginning of the frontier until the Civil War, there were a lot of people uh, uh, shooting each other. But there were way less uh, uh, mur- gun murders than in the first two weeks of the Civil War. So when you have something centralized like an army, or you can say the same example about uh, Middle Age uh, um, fights and wars in Europe, uh, they there were there there was war all the time. There were Vikings pillaging villages, but then uh, with a few weeks of uh, uh, French Revolution terror, you get more deaths and more causalities that in in all that. So you have a concentration of risk basically, and uh, European Union uh, seen as a centralization. Uh, program is exactly a concentration of risk uh, thing. You think you have peace unless uh, uh, you will have continental scale war uh, s- sometimes uh, again. If you think about that uh, uh, World War II, the World War I, they were coming from a very, very powerful, big uh, uh, nation state capable of total war. It would be impossible to have a World War kind of uh, massacre with uh, uh, town states, little uh, free states, uh, city states like, uh, I mean, Hong Kong will never uh, destroy the population of Liechtenstein. Uh, And uh, if the war was made up of many Liechtensteins and many Hong Kongs, you would have uh, more perceived disorder, but uh, more stable meta order, let's say. Okay. So with the EU itself, though, are you a fan of any parts of it? Only the common market, which is not really you, you think, because if you think about that, Switzerland is part of that, but it's not in the EU. So um, I would say no, not at all. Uh, the European Union as it is, is the bad part of the European integration. I am a fan of European level and world level free markets. I want to be free to exchange goods and services with people I, I care about and I trust and, I, and, and they serve me well, independently of them, of their ethnicity or nationality or passport. I don't care about uh, uh, imaginary lines between me and other people. I don't want to, co- to, to trade with the worst uh, Swiss guy, but with the best uh, Russian guy, if I can. What about free movement of people? 
That's a little bit uh, more d- debated and a more, little bit more divisive because there is the security concerns about, you know, what about terrorists? Mm-hmm. And uh, so even many people who are okay in principle with free movement of trades, they are uh, surprisingly, surprisingly, and I think inconsistently, okay with the restriction of movement of people. I think that the movement of people uh, is a threat only because it's, uh, we see that associated with other very strong political status intervention like uh, welfare parasitic states. So there is a st- in some countries that maybe were, were organized around a few, uh, a very small rich population like in uh, Northern Europe, then you have a strong incentive for, for free riders to move from other countries in order to, uh, to harvest, to benefit from this low hanging fruit on welfare. So you have a, a you have basically a distortion in which productive people they can find job uh, everywhere, but uh, non-productive people, parasitic people, uh, from an economical point of view, is not an, a personal insult. Will <laughs> tend to move toward big welfare states, and uh, and also uh, the state, the centralized state, uh, as a second feature that it tends always to uh, to make this, the citizen, the subject harmless and uh, disarmed uh, because it, it, uh, the, sa- the state wants to monopolize security first of all so you are uh, you are armless yeah, and you are uh, uh, you are disarmed you are uh, completely uh, exposed to risk uh, of personal threat and so you you start to care about uh, criminals terrorists because uh, you cannot defend yourself but if you think about that uh, borders at uh, a, a house uh, household level will be way more effective into managing security than borders at national levels because when i mean it's impossible to manage security from the internal terrorists for example or for people smuggled in or for people there since second generation so borders are not protecting you from terrorists the borders the decentralized borders of your household or your uh, gated community would but the nation state discourages always the delocalized decentralized security in order to encourage the uh, centralized nationwide security, which usually fails. And what are your feelings? I know it's separate, but what are your feelings on the single currency? Well, that's a little bit different, meaning that that's that's like asking me what I will feel about a single language. Uh, we are talking English right now, even if my uh, accent is Oxfordian and yours is a little bit, uh, I mean, uh, not so good as mine, but we are talking English <laughs> in a way, uh, because we want to converge toward a single standard. Uh, we tend to converge across uh, across the world to single standards. Uh, money is one of the standards where convergence is more critical and more important, even more than language, because you need uh, uh, you need to exchange, you need to optimize the, the problem of double confidence of, of wants across the biggest market that you can. So you want a single unit of account and a single medium of exchange. And also you want to move your wealth intergenerationally, so you need a single store of value. Uh, so money tends to be uh, convergent. I think that uh, money is one of the, those cases in which the political intervention, which usually is seen as something which uh, monopolize and uh, usually you see political intervention as uh, trying to uh, to aggregate stuff, uh, beating uh, competition and and and, um, and um, basically crippling competition. In the case of money, for example, I think the reason we have several fiat currencies is because of state intervention that tries to keep separate the standard, preventing people from finding a convergence. Uh, before fiat money, uh, the world, the civilized world basically had one uh, monetary standard, which was gold. Before it was also silver, then only gold when they switched from physical to, uh, to fiduciary scriptural. So gold was already a single, a single standard. So in the case of EU, it's strange because, uh, you know, uh, when you have centralization, you always have uh, a apparent, uh, an apparent improvement of local risk and the generation of global risk. What I mean is, Italy, for example, uh, the central bank of Italy had a terrible monetary policy. It was destroying wealth uh, all the time, inflating and debasing the currency. So it was crazy. When Italy en- entered the monetary union with the European Union, with Euro, things went better, actually, from, uh, from uh, um, a, a def- an inflation and debasement point of view. So much that uh, uh, the, the government couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't go on spend increasing sp- government government spending so much because they didn't have the money printer anymore. So in a way, this external boundary improved the condition in Italy locally, but at an expense of creating the incentives 
to a way worse, I mean, so far, the Central Bank of Europe is kind of conservative about money, is run by Ger German culture, which is very, very hurt by hyperinflation. So they know about hyperinflation, they tend to be conservative. But when you reduce the competition, when you, re when you rise the cost of uh, moving away from one choice to the other, the cost of opt-out, then the long run effect is most degeneration. Let's say that uh, if you, for example, I used as a typical example, Switzerland. In Switzerland, many, many policies and many, many regulations are decided at the town level. Well, that means that the cost for you to opt out from some regulation, from some standard, some legal uh, jurisdiction uh, configuration is just to move maybe 200 meters and speak the same language and keep your friends, keep your family close, keep your assets. And you just move uh, off your home. While, for example, in big centralized nation states, uh, the only way that you have in order to, to opt out some regulation is, uh, you know, the typical state is sent as move to Somalia. So since I don't like your regulation, I have to give up my family, my friends, my my, my loved ones, my assets, my language, my culture, my skill set, my business network. So that's, that's a huge cost to move. So in a, when you have competition, you can vote with your feet. When you don't have competition, you can only think you're voting with your hands in the, in the ballot, but actually that doesn't influence anything. So about money, I think that euro is better than many shitty currencies before euro so far, but it's creating the incentive for a super bad continental level hyperinflation eventually. So, and, and it's already happening. I know, um, uh, we were uh, hearing some central bankers talking. We, 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 we hear uh, Mario Draghi says that he will do whatever it takes uh, to save the current uh, finan uh, financial system, which is, uh, uh, which is dying under this uh, mass uh, uh, systemic risk and, uh, and debt concentration. So long run, uh, any kind of monetary unification driven by market forces is great and is, it is efficient, uh, is efficient, is what we want. While uh, the uh, forceful, uh, forced, uh, uh, top-down imposition of monetary standards is bad. It's the same with languages. Uh, it's good that we can speak English together, but it will be very bad for a nation state to impose a language to a native population, um, eradicating their language in a violent way. It's quite interesting you said you think we're heading towards hyperinflation potentially in Europe. It feels to me that the levels of debt across the world have been getting out of hand for years, potentially decades, but definitely years. The level of debt in the US is quite scary. Are we essentially across the whole planet kicking a can down the road? Yeah. We are uh, delaying risk, concentrating and delaying facing reality. What is the alternative option? <laughs> well, if you have a friend who is a junkie and uh, is, uh, is uh, increasing his doses of heroin all the time, uh, and now maybe he stops for a while and he starts to feel, uh, he starts to suffer a lot for a withdrawal crisis. So what can you do to, to make him feel better? Well, the, the, the obvious answer is to give him a, a double shot and to help him increase in the shots. But you know that eventually it will just, uh, it, is, it will just lead him to a worse crisis in the future. So there is uh, one answer which is a delay facing reality now in order to have a, a worse crisis later. So hide the, the problem under the desk or just facing reality now, which is always suffering basically. When there is something not work, so if you have a company and the company has a broken business model and uh, instead of closing down the company or pivoting the business model, somebody gives you extra money in order to go on. You are not really solving any problem. You are just uh, creating the conditions for a worse crisis later. So what is the alternative to uh, delaying continuously the, the facing? So reality is like gravity. When something goes up, eventually it will go down. So you can try to push and push and push against the laws of reality. Uh, probably biology is a better example because because it's a little bit more unpredictable than gravity. So the, the junkie man dying of, uh, 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 of overdose is a better example because it's a biological organism. You don't know where it's going to die. And maybe it will feel great after the next shot, but eventually you know that you don't know when, but you know it's going to die of overdose if it, if it keeps increasing. So one alternative is uh, suffering, so it's withdrawal. 
I'm sorry, you have to suffer, you have to liquidate the bad investment of the past, which is not good for everybody. It's certainly not good for your pusher and uh, it's, not, it's not good for you in the short term. But eventually, if you liquidate now, you have less suffering. If you liquidate the mistakes later, you will have m way more suffering. So the alternative is basically liquidation of, uh, of uh, bad debt. There is a good argument by Saifedi and Amus that uh, uh, hyper-Bitcoinization uh, could... could bring to hyperinflation of fiat money, but also maybe not, because uh, on one side, Bitcoin, hyper-Bitcoinization can take uh, monetary demand out of fiat, but also destroying debt and, and enforcing the liquidation of debt, it could also uh, take a lot of supply out of fiat, because much of the monetary supply of fiat is not uh, central bank money, but it's commercial bank uh, inflated, uh, inflated uh, reserve currency. Can countries do this in isolation, though? Because it feels like almost all countries are competing globally. So, for example, say the European Union decided, okay, we're going to stop taking our shots of heroin. We're going to take the pain. It feels like they would suddenly become less competitive than, say, China and, and the US and could fall behind. It's almost like a game of chicken. That's a very good point. I, I st uh, still staying in our metaphor, our very gloom <laughs> metaphor. Uh, is it easier uh, to to stop using if you are inside the community of junkies or or not? Of course, yeah. Uh, of course not. Uh, it's it's harder. You have a competition of people that uh, in the short term they feel better than you because they are they are they are they are making drugs. They're, they're doing drugs, and only in the long run you have your revenge when they die. You don't. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, but uh, in in this case they also. So there is a second problem, which is basically democracy. Uh, democracy is a system that incentivizes short-term decision a lot. The time preference of democracy as a system is incredibly high. So uh, a, a politician running for the next uh, uh, for an office in four years, he will never have incentives to take decision that implies suffering during his uh, his office. And then eventually, people getting better when the next guy will take his place. So in this sense, uh, this is a very uh, paradoxical and controversial notion, but it's, I think it's technically accurate that some kind of old-time monarchies were, were worse in some kind of situation, were way better, for example, when it comes to uh, time preferences. Because if you think you have to leave your, the kingdom to your son, uh, maybe your power is more arbitrary, maybe it's more, but you have a, a lower time preference because of that. So do you believe democracy is the will of the people or do you think democracy is really the will of a few men and even fewer women's career objectives so there are two answers to this question first the actual implementation of democracy uh, as an ideal is impossible there are several mathematical theorems explaining that you cannot really create a fair voting system because the uh, well game theories are such that eventually uh, you will uh, end up uh, uh, taking decisions that are not really expression of the majority uh, also there is a practical implementation problem of corruption the fact that uh, uh, the, the pure horizontal democracy don't doesn't scale and so you you end up with representative democracy and then uh, with lobbyism and then you end up basically with some kind of oligarchy or or car legal cartel so the the democracy as purely horizontal ideal doesn't work in practice it is not implementable but even if it was there is the the very theoretical problem that Benjamin Franklin was uh, was uh, mentioning with the famous sentence you know democracy is uh, two wolves and one sheep uh, taking a vote about what to, to have for breakfast and uh, liberty is uh, one sheep uh, well armed contesting the vote. So uh, the, the, the point <laughs> is that uh, in many occasions, democracy can be the will of the majority, but the will of the majority can be to disrespect the rights of the minority. And the, 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 the most important minority of all is the individual. And when one, I mean, if everybody is a white supremacist, but you are black, uh, majority can have its way, but that's not a good thing because you have your human rights. And if the majority of people is, I mean, you can make several examples and is, they're not theoretical example. Majority of people in, in many times during history uh, oppressed minority. And that's not really, uh, some people defending democracy, they, 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 they try to use this very uh, va vapor uh, notion, uh, very ambiguous notion that democracy is the will of the majority and at the same time is the total respect of the rights of the minorities. Which basically is like saying that it's not the will of the majority anymore. Uh, so, 
Um, I think that the ideal is uh, absolute uh, monarchy, but decentralized at the level with my kingdom is my home. And then I can do all the international treaties I want with my neighbor. Uh, we can create a network of uh, alliances, but uh, I think it was... Uh, it was, I think, uh, Tolkien uh, uh, writing to, to his son or a friend that his ideal is uh, anarchism or absolute monarchy, which is actually the same thing if you decentralize the kingdom enough. Don't you think we can make democracy better with a blockchain, though? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Or with Tezos. Come yeah, right. Absolutely. The block <laughs> okay, everything we're saying is assuming we're not using the blockchain. Yeah, if you I'm use joking. the blockchain, every problem we're discussing uh, goes away immediately. Everything solved. You know, yeah, I, yeah, I did absolutely. this... I did the same thing with Jimmy in Oslo the other day. I'm going to release that tomorrow. But uh, okay, so let, let's talk about Brexit. One of the interesting things is that the people of the UK voted for Brexit, right? We've got this very complicated process of trying to divorce ourselves. Whenever anybody discusses this on Facebook amongst my group, sometimes I'm the one putting out the questions just to see what the reactions are. It's overwhelmingly anti-Brexit. People want a second vote. People are against it. But you believe Brexit is good. Well, certainly good for the UK. Why? In, because of the, the discussion we had until now, I, I, I am strongly convinced that in general, political decentralization is better as incentives in the long run, which means that even if... For, so let, let's take a better example, because actually UK is a better example uh, for this because it's too easy for me, because I think that the policies of the European Union uh, as for taxes and, and stuff like that are, are objectively worse in many cases than the policy of the UK. But let's assume a case, for example, like Catalonia. In Catalonia, I think that the, the political culture there is very wrong in, by my perspective. They are both mostly socialists. They want to control the economy. They want to, uh, to ban Uber from the street. So the local politicians in Catalonia uh, wants to increase the level of uh, central planning and state control. But yet, uh, uh, even if the Spain government was completely classical liberal pro market, it would be better to have a separate Catalonia because of the incentive long run. When you create a decentralization, then you create a process of, comp of, of competition and of incentives uh, that uh, can get things better based on failures. So people can learn. So there is more skin in the game. There is the shorter feedback loop. When you are wrong, you suffer the consequence of you being wrong directly and people can opt out of your wrong decision easily. When, well you, when you centralized, when you are wrong, you can, you can hide the consequences. You can, uh, you can uh, basically export, you can uh, redirect the consequences towards somebody else. Think about things like uh, protectionism. Uh, uh, I want to ban every uh, foreign uh, good. If you are Hong Kong, you cannot do that. If you are Liechtenstein, you cannot do that. If I'm taking the extremes, of course. If you are France, you can do that, and you can. If you are Italia, in Italy, you can try to est establish fascism and to ban any kind of uh, for a uh, complete autarky. Uh, you cannot do that when you're small. So Catalonia, even a socialist, uh, stupid, uh, politically stupid Catalonia, in the long run will get better than a very illuminated and rational uh, national Spain. With Brexit, I, I think that the argument is double. Uh, there is the same argument, so it's better if uh, UK is not um, is not uh, strictly uh, yeah, centralized into uh, the policy of the United uh, the, um, the European Union. But it's also, I think, for uh, well, there are some counter example. For example, some Eastern European countries are better as tax level than UK. Ireland is better than UK, uh, but uh, the, the goal of the European Union is not to make the UK as good as Ireland, it is to make Ireland as bad as Italy. So uh, so when, when politicians talk about uh, harmonization, for example, tax harmonization, they don't mean that uh, your taxes will become the ones of Luxembourg. They mean that they want Luxembourg to stop providing competition to France or Italy or Germany or other uh, pretty much uh, statist uh, and uh, and uh, fiscally totalitarian countries. So uh, the, the argument there is uh, uh, it would be in, in Brexit, it would be probably better in the short run and in the long run. Maybe not really, not much in the short run, only because of uh, is explicitly explicit will of retaliation by the uh, European Union politi politi uh, politicians. They decided to uh, stop a possible domino, domino effect, so they decided to punish 
uh, in every possible way uh, UK if it leaves uh, the United the European Union because they're scared it will be successful. Yeah, uh, in that case, uh, for example, in in some cases, for example, so just to clarify. I am in favor of UK leaving European Union and Scotland leaving UK and Edinburgh leaving Scotland and eventually a guy in Edinburgh leaving the town council. So I'm I'm for uh, secession uh, down to the individual level is the only way you can have real competition in in policy making. But uh, if you have Scotland uh, uh, seceding from UK. For a while, UK can be safe that Scotland will not fare very well. In the long run, it will be better, but in the short run, they will suffer. While for European Union, it was, it was not the case because UK, a, as is, was uh, better off immediately uh, after, a, uh, let's say, let's call it secession. So uh, the problem is that they have to artificially create conditions to punish the UK uh, for the Brexit, and they are managing to do that in a way. They are creating a lot of problems that were not there. For example, now they want to, they are trying to frame Brexit as a, a, a something against free trade, but actually the request by the Brexit party was mostly to keep the free trade, to keep the uh, the market, the unique market, and to get uh, and to get away just with uh, central bureaucratization and central politicization. So get away with the political union and the bureaucratic union, and just leave the freedom of exchange with other European countries. If that was the case, the UK was going to be immediately better off, and that would be a very bad signal for European bureaucracies. Next up, I talk to Giacomo more about Brexit and how Bitcoin is relevant. But before that, I've got a message from my show sponsors. So I want to tell you about my new sponsor, Acquainting again. Did you check them out? Did you hear my first ad for those last week? So if you want to take your tax seriously with your crypto holdings, you've definitely got to go and check them out. And not only because they're a great tax tool, but they have one of the best portfolio managers available. And you know what? The two go hand in hand. If you're going to want to report your taxes, you should manage your portfolio alongside it. And the great thing is it's all free until the point you want your tax report. So you can manage your portfolio in there without charge. Only at the time when you need your report do you pay. And you know what? They're pretty cheap. They're the best priced tax tool in the market. And also, when you see the tool, when you go and play with it, you're going to see what I've seen, which is an amazing UX, something I always talk about. I'm a big fan of UX. I'm a big fan when it's done right. So you'll see that. They've built something which is so easy to use. And as I said, it doesn't just calculate your tax. It also optimizes your trading decisions to ensure you trade the right coins to reduce your tax burden. And you can import your data from all major exchanges and wallet providers. You've got to go and check them out. They're accointing.com, which is A C C. O-I-N-T-I-N-G dot com. That is acquainting dot com, which is A-C-C-O-I-N-T-I-N-G dot com. And then Dropbit, have you downloaded their wallet yet? Come on, you've got to get the Dropbit wallet. It is amazing. I'm using it all the time now. It is for me the best mobile wallet for Bitcoin out there without doubt. It's like a Venmo for Bitcoin. It's so easy to send and receive Bitcoin. Whenever I'm traveling now, I am using it all the time. The UX is amazing. It's so easy to either paste an address or use someone's phone number to send them Bitcoin. It's available on the iPhone and Android. If you want to go and play with it, head over to dropbit.app, which is D-R-O-P-B-I-T dot app. That is dropbit.app, which is D-R-O-P-B-I-T dot app. And last, not least today, I've got the Georgian Impact Podcast, which wants to bring you the first-hand look at the big opportunities and issues facing today's software entrepreneurs. On the show, they interview CEOs and founders of software companies and other thought leaders in the space, so you can hear firsthand how they are working to solve business problems with cutting-edge technology. The show helps CEOs, founders, and product leaders, and anyone who's interested in the latest developments in the software startup scene to understand a range of topics, including machine learning and artificial intelligence, conversational interfaces, privacy, ethics, and trust in AI, blockchain, quantum computing, and other emerging technology trends. If you want to find out more, you got to search for the Georgian Impact Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast.
Do you think this could lead to the breakup of the EU? So uh, it depends on how successful the European Union bureaucrats are into making like uh, seem like an apocalypse. Uh, right, already right now, uh, when you post on Facebook and there is a lot of uh, remain uh, sentiment, you have also to consider the the the, the so-called uh, shy Tory effect. So for some reason, uh, every policy which is uh, less ideologically statist is uh, less fancy to uh, to declare in public. So there is a very strong effect. Uh, uh, people tend to be very rational when uh, so people are extremely rational when they buy for themselves they are kind of rational when they vote and they are completely irrational when they speak so when you speak it's really always group thinking always politically correctness you want to be part of the pre of the prevailing sentiment and statists are very good at managing the narrative about prevailing sentiments so when you speak especially to pro government uh, and pro state uh, uh, media uh, uh, and when you want to fit the narrative you are always pro the most statist option there so if uh, the most statist option is remain you are pro remain then when you vote you can be a little bit more rational, not much, because you're still not directly... So your vote, uh, mathematically speaking, doesn't do anything to reality. So voting from an individual level is a little bit like uh, going to uh, some kind of religious ritual of a region which is not true. You uh, you light up your, your candle and you hope, but nothing impacts reality. So if you think about mathematics, your single vote doesn't count. So uh, the voter doesn't have a strong incentives to be rational because the, his single action will not change the decision. Well, when you actually have to, when, a, when an entrepreneur wants to to hire a, 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 an employee or to choose a provider for some services, he will look for the best and not for the, uh, for the more politically correct. Right, okay. Going back to the actual process then of negotiating the exit, do you think the UK showed too much of a weak hand to Europe? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm not so much into internal uh, UK things, but my perception from uh, from a safe space in Switzerland was that uh, the, the the conservative uh, leadership was uh, completely playing into the hands of the European bureaucrats. So it was, uh, it was, a, I think, it was a disaster negotiation so far. So how do you think they should have done things differently? Well, hard fist. <laughs> Bye, we're off. See you later. Come to us if you want to negotiate. I, I think uh, that at the, at the very beginning, with, uh, with, still, uh, with a fresh vote, with a strong popular support, because even the Remainers, they, they were... Now, we are, I mean, uh, memories fade away, and now we want to vote again. Maybe it was not correct. Maybe the old people voting for Brexit, and now they are dead, so it's now, now we have to vote again. So now time has passed. The leadership has, has become weaker but at the beginning they they had the strong hand so if they wanted to negotiate hard i think that they wanted first of all they they had to in my opinion to clarify more as a narrative that they were not against the unified market not against free trade because that was the point i mean even if you think about nigel farage he was it was never campaigning maybe a little bit a, a, a against free migration there mm -hmm. was some ambiguity there because maybe some racism some xenophobia can come into play but about free trade, for example, it was uh, it was crystal clear. So uh, the, if the Brexit leadership, if the UK leadership was about, we want free trade, we can have it because Switzerland have it and Norway have it. So that's not a EU thing. That's not a EU thing. That's a that's a free trade thing. We want that. Uh, we don't. We are not accepting any kind of other imposition. Uh, maybe. But still, uh, it's not. I mean, maybe I, I may. Uh, I think it's too easy than it is, and of course, it's a very big game. And of course, the European Union has uh, any incentives to make. I mean, for the European Union, as you were saying before, that's basically a, uh, a an, an all-in. If they lose this, they risk a domino effect. They risk uh, Valonis with in uh, in uh, in uh, again Basque. I mean, uh, Veneto in Italy can succeed and Catalonia. I mean, if you start up, if you open up the can of se se section, se secession, uh, then you don't know how far it can get. What do you think of the second vote? What do you think of the negatives of it actually happening? So, if there was a second vote, and say the vote was then to remain. It's a it's Anarchy? a clown show, but it's a, it it will not, so it will prove my point that uh, democracy is a, is a farce. 
but uh, it will also prove the point that uh, so-called uh, democratic uh, activists are hypocrites because they, they promote an ideology which I don't share. I don't share absolute democracy, as I explained, but uh, they do, uh, they pretend to do. So uh, people voted, so you should follow that, but it will not be the first time, especially at the European level. Do you remember the referendum to approve the European constitution in Ireland? It was like, uh, do you want this constitution? Uh, popular vote, no. Oh, okay, let's try again. Do you want this constitution? And they went on until they said yes. So basically you, you take you wear them, them down. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it's, a, it's a very hypocritical thing. So maybe from a rhetoric point of view, that's, that's, a, that's a bullet in, in our gun that uh, this old democracy thing is uh, kind of uh, hypocritical. Do you even think that it should have come to a referendum? It's the kind of thing the people should be voting? Or do you think it's something that the people we vote in should be making decisions on? Oh, neither. Uh, if I had to neither. think in abstract terms, I think that any single individual should decide if he wants to join this or that political, uh, political, um, let's say, jurisdiction. Uh, of course, I know that this is a very long shot. I know that this sounds irrealistic. So, uh, I mean, if you want me to give the ideal response is yep. neither. We, we, you should vote only on your property. Uh, if uh, And you should eventually act with force only on people violating your property. Uh, except for that, no vote is, is uh, useful or, or productive. Then, if you want to introduce some realism constraints, then uh, uh, I can become re progressively reasonable, uh, but it really depends on a constraint. Uh, uh, sometimes democracy is better, than not, uh, sometimes is not. Uh, European is European Union is not really uh, is not really even a dictatorship. Is pure bureaucracy. So I think that's kind of the, the the worst of the two wars. So you actually believe in a society and a structure whereby everybody is completely individual, completely sovereign for every decision of themselves relating to their property. As a matter of rights, yes. Yeah. Then you can delegate exceptions because you you can you can join uh, you can join alliance you can join contracts. Basically, think about the nation states today. Today you have a nation states. So you have a, a, a you have a uh, basically an international law. International law says that any state any nation state can do whatever the I don't know, can we say fuck? In you can say fuck. Okay, whatever the fuck they want, unless they aggress the borders, the physical border of another state, and that's, that's a, that, that, that there is a reason for every other state to, to, keep, to, to get him uh, back in his place with force, or if it violates international treaties. So, basically, property and contracts. If you, there is not a world police, I mean, there is, there is the USA, but there is not legally a world police that can decide everything on, from, a juris, uh, from a juridical point of view. Factually speaking, there is a, there is a strong guy in the room who can be can have a strong influence over others. But from a matter of rights, every state has, has its rights. So what I think is rational to uh, what I believe, but I think it's just, uh, it's just a consequence of logic, is that uh, if you substitute uh, national borders to private property and uh, international treaties to interpersonal contracts, you basically have what uh, our grand-grandparents would basically call natural rights, which are like the logical rights. It's uh, uh, basically it's don't steal other people's stuff, don't damage other people's stuff, including their body, and if you make a promise, you should respect it, otherwise people will, uh, will have a right for compensation, proportional compensation. That's, that's, uh, I don't think that's even cultural, or uh, that's actually the only logical way to resolve conflicts. But do you still have countries and governments in those scenarios? Uh, you could have something that, for example, Mura Rothbard work was calling na nations by consent. You can have, for example, uh, Mises, uh, von Mises, he, he was saying, I'm not against the state. The state is great. It's the best achievement for society. The only thing is the state should respect uh, the right of secession, even at the individual level. So you can... Uh, the, the, one of the typical uh, uh, the typical uh, red herrings uh, and the strawman arguments uh, by states is, is to conflate uh, uh, coercive na centralized nation states with uh, any kind of political organization. If you are an individual kingdom, you can create any sort of alliance or treaties as, as long as you can also take it back when you want to take it back. So you can enter alliances and you can exit alliances. Uh, unfortunately, in the, in the last two centuries, we have seen some alliances forming and uh, when the people wanted to secede from this alliance, they started to use uh, aggression in order to keep them in, like uh, American Civil War, which was not 
I mean, this is very controversial and I want to go, don't want to go there. But it, I don't think it was mostly about slavery, which is a terrible uh, original sin of the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, freedom concept. Uh, but there were statist, uh, uh, there were uh, slavist states across the, uh, in the Union and there were st uh, slaveless states in the Confederacy. Right, okay. I can't see how we get to such a scenario as that. Uh, it's the, one of the things about uh, natural rights for philosophy and what people can call libertarian philosophy is yeah. that uh, when it's correctly intended, it's not a final state philosophy, it's not an ideal, it's not a utopia. It's not that I have a system, it's perfect, let's try the system and if we get there, it's, it's perfect. It's a process. The process is basically, we should have zero people hurting other people or taking other people's stuff or violating contracts. That's impossible. But I can tell you that the less we have of that, the better we are off in the long run. It's a, the typical example is medicine. So you, me, you meet a medical doctor. How unrealistic it is a world without diseases or without that? That's scientifically unrealistic. So yeah. is this, a, is this a medical doctor crackpot? No, he's really trying to fight any disease. He knows it is impossible. He tries to minimize so suffering and uh, unhygienic uh, 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 habits and stuff like that. Uh, so he will try to improve and he knows that the direction is uh, disease bad health good mm -hmm. so freedom good uh, criminal aggression bad i don't tell you that it's possible to get to a zero criminal aggression state but i think we are in a culture that legitimizes systematic aggression to a world scale we can get better than that okay so back to brexit and thinking about my friends and their concerns and some of the things that come up so we covered peace we said that's a false narrative. Maybe correlated with open markets, but yeah. not with uh, your centralization. We're going to be queuing at the borders every time we want to go on holiday now. So, uh, borders, uh, that, that's, uh, in my opinion, borders is a status imposition. Uh, I, I, I know why many uh, partially libertarian people are still defending borders because they think that, uh, well, we discussed that, right? There is a perception that uh, borders provide security. And even people who is uh, market-oriented, so they don't mind uh, uh, goods and services crossing borders, they are scared about people uh, crossing borders. And that will actually, uh, that's a problem when you have to visit another country. But the, the theory about secession is not to give away your right to cross a border without being bothered. Uh, you, you I mean, I'm completely okay if the European states uh, create uh, uh, bilateral agreements with UK in order to let me pass in and out without any kind of control. Actually, the European Union didn't really pro provide anything different from that. I mean, when I go to UK, I still have to show my passport to some random uh, bureaucrats that, 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 that don't know me and don't have any right on my personal uh, uh, movement liberty. Because we might have to revert to World Trade Organization rules, which is, is it a 20% levy, I think? Yeah. 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 That this is going to be devastating for the UK economy. It's going to drive us into recession. I think that's not a point that we can dismiss as, uh, I mean, you can make some rhetorical argument like, no, it's going to be good because you can probably, uh, you can probably, uh, um, um, you can fight exaggerations in apocalyptic scenarios, but they have a point. Uh, if the European Union is going to punish UK uh, in order to set a precedent for other countries, then the UK economy will be worse off. Maybe recession is a strong word. Uh, if I mean, if the next uh, political leadership is uh, smart enough to implement uh, huge liberalization of the economy, maybe they can com overcompensate this damage. But it will be naive to say Brexit will not. But it's, we're back to the same point of before. Uh, I'm sorry, but you are a junkie. You're a junkie. You can yeah. suffer now, or you can suffer more later and eventually die. And you think the suffering is worth it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you are liquidating mistakes of your past, suffering is the only thing that uh, that works. So, how do you think this is going to play out? Because for me, I've got this real fear that we're going to have a second vote, and it will be a Remain vote, and then it's all going to be kind of brushed under the carpet and forgotten about. 
So um, I think that's the worst scenario as well. Uh, but it's also very realistic. Uh, I'm kind of uh, cynical about anything political right now. I was a political activist back in uh, I don't know, 2010. Yeah, you were a member a, of a party, weren't you? You told no, me about it for a group. I, I was never in a party. I created, well, a Tea Party organization that yeah. was not a political party. It was a grassroots movement, uh, uh, basically emulating the Ron Paul camp- Tea Party campaign. Then yeah. the name Tea Party was uh, took over by Republicans, but originally it was a libertarian thing. Yeah. And I created the, the same anti-tax movement in Italy. I was debating the prime minister in television live. So I had my moments of fun. Uh, but then I realized that, uh, uh, I mean, I'm skeptical about uh, uh, de- democracy in, in na- modern democracy in nation states uh, is a game created to uh, to come to this kind of uh, concentration of power into the end of the state uh, uh, output. So you cannot play uh, their game and win. Uh, you can have... But uh, you can have il- the illusion of winning some battles. Oh, we have uh, we have our Ronald Reagan, and we can lower taxes. But that's just that's just a freak show. That's just uh, that's just uh, entertainment. Uh, the the uh, the big dynamics of the state is the state in- increasing its power. I am more optimistic in general because of non politi- non typically political means like Bitcoin, and we are back where we usually start. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bitcoin is a way to. Uh, to start a political and fight a political revolution without any, without shooting any, uh, any, uh, any bullet and without uh, casting any vote. Okay, so if somebody is listening to this and they are worried about Brexit, they think we should be part of the EU, how do you convince them that Brexit is a good idea and what are the benefits they will see? Uh, I, I, I really don't want, I mean, I could try to <laughs> be rhetorically effective, but I think that uh, it will be just a, a short-term vi- rhetorical victory. The point right, okay. is, uh, uh, this is go- this is gonna suck. And uh, <laughs> but if you if you really try to follow the logic and you don't follow emotions and you don't follow easy political narratives, but if you try to follow logic, you will see that the alternative is to uh, have a system which can suck orders of money to the worst. Uh, it's uh, it's literally. Uh, centralization of conti- continental wise uh, uh, nation blocks is something that can create uh, the equivalent of world wars, but worse. Uh, it's, it's Orwellian. Um, locally, this is bad. Globally, uh, you're better off. That said, I know that I will probably not convince them. And um, I think that Brexit will be severely uh, reduced in its power. Uh, at least for for some years. So vote Brexit and buy Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, buy Bitcoin. And uh, so this is the thing, mathematically speaking, your vote doesn't impact reality. So don't vote Brexit, but uh, if you can, you can make... Uh, if you can make 10,000 10, people vote in breakfast, b- Brexit, then you should. But your, your single vote, uh, if, you, if, you make, if you do the math, so my, my threshold for a vote, for example, I do vote for town council yeah. because my vote can actually impact reality. Uh, but uh, my threshold that uh, when I started to learn probability in high school, I calculated the probability of, vo- of uh, voting affecting reality. I understood it was a religion, re- a religious ritual, most, uh, most than anything. And so I decided this threshold. If uh, the probability to affect the reality with my vote is yeah. higher than the probability to get struck by an asteroid, asteroid while I walk to the to the to the to the polling <laughs> station, then I will go. Uh, because you know, uh, voting is. Uh, I mean, asteroids are, are dangerous, and yeah. I want to be sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But buy Bitcoin. But buy Bitcoin. So obviously, it's a Bitcoin show. If any of my friends listen to this, they're going to be, "Why are you doing this?" Like, what is the connection here with Bitcoin? What is the bigger picture? So I think that the same reasoning we are discussing about political centralization is actually very, very uh, 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 straightforwardly applied to Bitcoin itself. The point of decentralization in Bitcoin is always a trade-off between convenience uh, and efficiency and uh, long-term security. When you decide, for example, to not store your keys, but to just uh, put your Bitcoins in some kind of third-party custodian, then you are better off uh, not just as, as convenience, uh, we, we usually say that that uh, that user experience and security are in a trade-off. But locally speaking, most of the time, your security. If I mean, we tell people be your own bank, uh, not your keys, not your coins. But we have to be honest. 
If you are your own bank, your risk of losing your keys sometimes is higher and not lower uh, of, of or your risk of getting your keys robbed than if you were just using a custodian solution. So uh, custodian solution are, are not just uh, uh, easier. They're also sometimes safer because there is, you know, there is a di 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 um, division of labor and there is uh, a economies of scale. The same goes for node running. If you don't run your node, you don't verify your payments. So you can trust uh, Mycelium or Ledger or whatever, or worst of all, miners with SPV to validate the transaction for you. But uh, if you do that, maybe you are better off than running your node because you will mess up with your node. But yeah. globally speaking, you know that if everybody does like that, then we will create incentives to get worse and worse and worse. So it's the same trade-off. If you uh, for So usually you want to delegate uh, because that's easier and sometimes even safer. But when you delegate, you create the systemic risk long term. This is the same for uh, firearms. Uh, is, is it more effective for, effective for you to defend yourself with a gun from a criminal or for a policeman, trained policeman? Of course, uh, it's more effective for a trained policeman, assuming it can arrive in time. But the problem is that if everybody thinks like that, then you have an easy takeover by a totalitarian government because nobody can resist. Think about the children in school. So we were discussing homeschooling, for example, and somebody was pointing out that when you do homeschooling with uh, 20 families together and you hire some professional teacher for some, some, for some topic, then you created school again. So centralization is always easy. But the point is that when something is very critical, safety critical, then you should give up some efficiency in mm -hmm. order to maintain a long-term incentive uh, structure, which is better. So it's the same. Uh, as, uh, the secession in which uh, you secede from Coinbase uh, and you secede from SPV, Ash Power, and you are your own key storage and your own validation node it's hard it sucks you can also get it wrong maybe you will be worse off in the beginning but in the long run you are creating better incentives for uh, for long-term global security it's a trade-off between local personal situation and global systemic uh, situation basically also the second connection with bitcoin is that of course we are discussing brexit and uk but you should know there are two uks and uh, <laughs> and people is is wondering why there are two uks so uh uh, we are explaining. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you were well, thinking to get away with this, yeah, right? Well, there's, there's UK and there's Great Britain. Yeah, that, that's good. Cool. So UK politics uh, is way more. I mean, there also I angle. Uh, there was a video about uh, uh, two guys in the in a bathroom, and they were discussing like uh, soccer teams uh, with uh, Olympic teams uh, with political uh, structures, and the U UK is a mess. Like you have yeah. England, Great Britain, the Empire, the Commonwealth. You, you have everything. So we play football as nation states. So we play football as England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales. So but the smart move by Peter is the, to blame his uh, shit coinery on uh, UK politics. So, 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 no, there are more bitcoins <laughs> because uh, I'm from UK and I'm confused about all these uh, these names no, going no, around. And, but then with the Olympics, we compete as Great Britain. Yeah. So I think we had a team for the London 2012. We found a way of coming together and getting a team together, but we don't do it ever. Also Ireland, right? Ireland is together with uh, with Ulster in one so, so thing and not in the other. So Northern Ireland is part of see this is where i might even come across as dumb i think it's part of the united kingdom yeah correct but the republic of ireland isn't part of either <laughs> exactly but they play together in some kind of international so i th i think the island play together on rugby yeah exactly. yeah they don't have a separate northern island rugby but they have a separate northern island football <laughs> i know it's madness like basically it's just it's like all the results of colonialism. So if you don't want your Bitcoin uh, life to become as messy as the as the Great Britain UK life, you should know there's just one Bitcoin and, just and, one Bitcoin. and stop wondering. Yeah, stop wondering. Don't listen to any of the bullshit that Pete McCormack says. Or Pedro. Yeah, Pedro the fucking degenerate. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right really, thanks, Giacomo. That was great. Really useful. Thank you for coming on again. Pleasure. Okay, so how was that? What did you make of what Giacomo had to say about Brexit? I know it's not a full-on Bitcoin show, but I think it's relevant. I think it's something we need to think about. There are definitely some things related to Brexit which relate to Bitcoin. I th also, you know, even if it didn't, I think it's just a subject I know I want to know more about. And I think he makes some compelling arguments. And I definitely need to spend some more time understanding libertarianism. Bloody hell, with Bitcoin, there are so many things I need to understand more about. 
not enough time in the day to read it all. Luckily, I get to speak to all these amazing people to find out more stuff. But what do you think? Are you in the UK or are you not? Do you care? Are you in Europe? Do you want the UK to stay? Do you want the UK to go? Are you in America, Australia? What do you care? What do you think about this? You know, reach out to me. Let me know what you think. Personally, I think I want Brexit now. And I know this is going to piss off a bunch of people, especially some of my friends. And having the debate on Facebook, there aren't many people who are pro-Brexit. And I can sympathize with their points, you know, especially the short term pain. I've spoken to friends who have telling me what the impact on their company is going to be. But perhaps Giacomo's right. Perhaps this is going to save us from some longer term future pain. So yeah, I'm kind of pro Brexit now. I definitely don't want a second vote. I think that would be terrible. But yeah, let me know your thoughts. And if you've got any questions, you can reach out to me. And thank you to everyone who supports the show. Everything you do, like it's been going, what, 18 months now? And I've had so much support in all different ways. And if you do want to support the show, if you're a regular listener and you're thinking, I've never done anything, I listen to every show. Certainly if you skip the ads, then there's some more things you can do. But look, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Just listen to the ads. That's helpful. That's helpful to my sponsors who pay for me to do all this. You can become a patron. You head over to patreon.com forward slash what Bitcoin did. You can buy some merch on my website. You can leave me a review on iTunes. You can subscribe to the newsletter. You can follow me on Twitter. You can go to my website. You can sign up for the newsletter and you can share the show out with your friends and family. Loads of things you can do. It's all listed on my website. Just go to whatbitcoindid.com and click on the support section. Anyway, loads more interviews are in the bag. Uh, Next week, I've got more coming out. I've got a really amazing one that I recorded in Munich with a quantum physicist where we discuss the threat of quantum computer to Bitcoin. Definitely one of my favorite interviews. Definitely a fun one. If you enjoyed my one with Andrew Polster, I think you'll enjoy this. Anyway, as I said, if you want to reach out to me, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. 